let's open up to Genesis 3. And uh, I don't know if you guys do this here, but I like to make everyone stand up when we read God's word in reverence of his word. So when you find it, please stand up or we might have it on the screens here. Genesis 3. We're going to read the whole chapter. All right. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field and on your belly you shall go and the dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat of the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. And the man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skin and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Amen. You can be seated. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for this day. And Lord, we thank you so much for your truth. Lord, no matter how much we try by our human efforts to find the truth, we cannot find it unless it is revealed to us. And we praise you that you are a God who does not remain hidden, but you are a God who reveals himself to us. Lord, you are the truth that we need, and your word is what we need more than anything. Lord, we pray today that you would remind us of our hunger and thirst for the truth. Lord, there are so many things being fed to us through our eyes, through our ears, through our hearts and our minds that are deceptive lies. And we pray, God, that as we sit under your word today, that your spirit of truth would teach us, teach us to listen to your word. Lord, we pray, God, that you would remind us today how unworthy we are, how undeserving we are of anything. 
And Lord, would you break our hearts because of our sin? And Lord, would you remind us how awesome, how surpassing your grace and love for us truly is? Would you bring us to conviction and repentance today that we may glory in the worship of Jesus Christ? We pray, God, that you would connect the dots to us in our hearts of how he is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the solution to all things. Lord, we thank you for speaking into our corrupt and broken lives and this world that is dying and decaying because your word is life. So would you fill us with your life today? In Jesus' name, amen. As some of you might know, uh, recently I was a victim of a pretty crazy crime in this past April. Uh, I was coming home from playing basketball at a church late at night, and as I was backing into my garage, uh, a woman in a ski mask holding a gun crawled under my garage door as it was closing, tried to force her way into my car. I refused to open the door, and she proceeded by firing a gun into the car that I was in. The bullet was about 10 inches away from my face. She asked for my wallet, I gave it to her, and she ran away. It was uh, really scary, really traumatic, not only for me, but for my family. Of course, my wife heard the gunshot, ran into the garage. She sees me sitting in the car with glass all over the ground. You know, she thought I was dead. And uh, luckily, uh, she was caught three days later. She didn't get much. I only had like $150 in my wallet. Um, not a smart move by any chance, but it happened, and it was, a, it was a great reminder of how destructive sin is. But another thing that it reminded me of is that this woman and me aren't that different. We're not that different because there's some lies that she believed that day that led her to do this that were the same lies that I used to believe in. Now, some of you know my testimony, but I didn't grow up with much. I'm a pastor's kid. And one of the things I would do is uh, I would steal. Every time I needed something, I would just go to the store and I would steal it. Why? Because I believed this lie that because I didn't have as much as others, I somehow had, had the right to do that. That others had enough money to take care of their own, but I didn't. So. Therefore, I, I deserved what I was going to take. I also believed a whole bunch of lies, one of which was just, man, this life sucks. This life sucks. So I'm going to do whatever I can to try to create an escape from this reality. So before I was even 21, I was a raging alcoholic and a drug addict. I think one of the things that I was able to be reminded of that connects me with this person that did this crazy thing, terrible thing, was I realized that she was searching for paradise. And we're all searching for paradise. Every one of us here, we're, we're longing for paradise. And I know I'm starting in Genesis 3. I wish I could preach Genesis 1 and 2 today, but we'd be here for three hours. But Genesis 1 and 2 show us the paradise that we were made for. And the thing is, because we're eternal beings, because we have souls, we long for that paradise. No matter how broken this world is, we know that it's not supposed to be this way. And we're doing whatever we can to get back to this paradise that is lost and is it's actually this good desire that we have that leads us to commit all kinds of evil. It's because when paradise was lost, everything got corrupted. Our desires, our discernment, our relationship with God, our relationship with each other, everything got messed up. And it's this good desire for paradise to try to regain that which was lost that motivates us to do 
crazy, evil, wicked things. Today I want to talk about sin. I know it's everyone's favorite subject here. But I feel like I need to remind us why it's so important for us to talk about sin. And Phil got us off to a good start there with the tortilla slap story. But we really need to understand sin. Because more than almost anything else, it's what we have in common with everyone else on the planet. No matter how much money you make, no matter what kind of family you came from, no matter what kind of job or education you have, whether you're male or female, whether you're black, white, or Asian, we're all sinners. We're all sinners. There's a philosopher named Albert Camus, I think is his last name. He's a French philosopher from the 1940s. I don't believe in, I don't agree with most of his stuff, but he says this profound statement. He says, the evil that is in the world always comes from ignorance and good intentions may do as much harm as malevolence if they lack understanding. Your good intentions are not enough. My good intentions are not enough. That woman that, that robbed me and fired a gun into my car for $150. In a very twisted way, she had good intentions for herself. She's trying to regain the paradise that was one lost, once lost. We need to understand our sin. We need to understand what it is that is this condition that we're all born with. It's this sickness. Sin is every, evident everywhere. You know, it's outside of us. We see it all over the news, right? If sin didn't exist, I don't think the news would either, right? The news is so good at telling us all the things that are bad. I don't know about you, but every time I turn on the news, my anxiety just goes up because crime is rising, inflation is rising. Sin's ever, everywhere. We can't escape it. And unless we understand the nature of sin, we'll miss, we'll miss so easily how much we are in desperate need of Jesus. The central idea of today's text is that sin is far more deceptive, destructive, and debilitating than we tend to think it is. It's far more deceptive, destructive, and debilitating than we tend to think it is. However, God's power and grace are infinitely greater. I hesitate to even add that to the central idea of today's text because sometimes we, we don't really dwell on our sin enough. We only talk about it enough to be kind of this origin story to why Jesus came and died for us. And yes, that's the gospel. But today I want us to really be honest and open with ourselves. And I want you to be praying as you hear the word of God preached to you. What sins have deceived me? What lies are destroying my life? in my relationships? What sin is debilitating me from the potential and the paradise that is given to me in Christ? God's power and grace are infinitely greater than our sin, but that is by no means a reason for us to belittle our sin. The sermon in a sentence is simple. I'll give you the end at the beginning. You need to stop trusting yourself. And you need to start trusting in Jesus because he's the only solution to sin. Sin is the big problem with everything. Everything that's wrong with your life in this world, it's sin. And you're not the solution. So stop trusting yourself. Trust in Jesus. He's the solution. This is a very simple message for all of us. Jeremiah 17, 9 is one of the most important verses in the Bible. It tells us the heart is deceitful above all else. Above everything else, the heart is deceitful. You think the news is deceitful? You think the internet is deceitful? Your heart inside you is deceitful above all else and desperately sick. That's what it tells us in Jeremiah 17, 9. We have to come to terms with this first and realize that we need the truth, not from how we feel, not from our opinions, 
not from our values, in a very frank way, none of that matters. You might hear me preach today and say, I don't agree with that. It doesn't really matter. What matters is what God's word says. If you want to create a world that is based on your values and your principles, well, go try and do what God did. Create this universe. You can't. What matters is what God tells us. And we'll get into it, but really the origin of sin has everything to do with how we respond to God's word. So we need to check ourselves today as we go into the word. I'm going to jump into Genesis 3. I'm going to be referring back to it. So if you have your Bibles open, just, just have it ready. In verse 1, it says, A serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. We find out later in the Bible that this serpent was kind of a manifestation or possessed by Satan, the enemy, the adversary. But the serpent itself isn't given much attention here in the Bible in Genesis 3. The serpent isn't talked about. We don't have this whole backstory about the serpent. It's just a serpent. There was nothing special about the serpent. It wasn't a deity of any kind. It was just an instrument that was used by Satan. One of the unique things about the Genesis account of creation and the biblical cosmology is that there's only one deity that matters. There's no cosmic conflict between gods. There's no, there's no good force and evil force combating and then God comes out on top. No, it's just one supreme and sovereign author of reality itself, the Lord God. So the serpent comes up to the woman and starts with this phrase, did God actually say? I'll just pause there. Did God actually say? Right? If you ever hear this from someone else or your own thoughts, you know, get your guard up. Did God actually say? We do this all the time. Did God actually say, I need to worship him on Sundays? Did God actually say that he's the Lord of my finances? Did God actually say I need to love my enemies? Did God actually say that sex before marriage is a sin? Did God actually say we need to follow everything in the Bible? Well, this is where you know that came from. But the more deceptive part of it is actually what follows that. The serpent says, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? If you know the story, God never said you can't eat of any tree. He said you can eat of all the trees except this one, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But notice how the serpent says, did God tell you you can't eat of any tree? What the enemy's doing here is trying to make Adam and Eve think of God in a negative light, even though he's not. Even though God created everything for them, the devil's trying to highlight that there's something that's being withheld from them. The first weapon the enemy uses against us is to make us doubt the word of God. This is the first weapon of the enemy, and sadly, this is a very effective strategy against us as human beings. We so easily doubt the word of God. We so easily revise our Bibles. We might carry the entire Bible in our hand or on our phone. But let's be honest, there's just parts that we just ignore. Because we don't want to acknowledge that God actually said some things that he said. What does Eve say in verse 2? She says, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. So Eve's kind of relaying what was told to her. If you know Genesis 2, Eve wasn't actually created when God gave this command. God gave this command to Adam. Then Eve was created. So the fact that Eve knows the command 
shows that Adam relayed the message to her and maybe he added an extra parameter, don't even touch it. But the serpent says to the woman in verse four, you will not surely die. Okay, here's where we go from, did God actually say to overtly saying the opposite of what God said? God said, you will surely die. And the serpent says, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Wow. There's three lies, three powerful lies that the enemy is using here. Number one, when we're tempted to sin, we are given the lie that the consequences of our sin are going to be far less than what we expect. Right? Everyone knows this? Everyone's experienced this, right? We tell ourselves, we rationalize. If I cheat on this test, it's going to be okay. No one's going to know. If I watch this pornographic video, no one will know. Maybe it will even be better for my marriage so I won't have contempt for my wife. I should just go ahead and gossip about this person behind their back. Why? Because it's better than keeping it in, right? And just letting resentment just, you know, swell up in there. I got to let it out. You will not surely die. That's the first lie. That the consequences are far less or trivial. The second lie is that we're given the lie that God is not good. Satan's basically saying through the serpent here, God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open. There will be a benefit that God is trying to keep from you. He wants you to stay stupid. He wants you to stay ignorant. That's why he's telling you not to eat this. God is holding back great wisdom and knowledge from you. If he loved you, why would he do that? If he's good, why would he do that? And if God isn't good, why would you trust him? You should make decisions for yourself. The third lie of any, contemption, any temptation is that we deserve better than what God has given us. This is when the serpent says, you will be like God. Wow, you will be like God. As if it wasn't enough to be made in the image of God and given the privilege to rule over creation with him and walk with him in the garden. That's not enough. How God has made you isn't enough. You need to be like God. This is at the heart of every sin. The desire to be God. Not the desire to be man, to be human the way we were made in the image of God, but to be God. I'm just going to give you a few real examples that are just facing us today in our culture. Not that these are the only ones, but they're really important. This whole debate over gender fluidity. You know what that is? That's a desire to be God. You know who determined the genders? God. He made man and woman. He made them differently. He made them with specific purposes in mind. But now as a society, we've decided, no, this is, this is open. This is fair game. We get to define what gender roles are. We get to define what gender we are. This is crazy. We don't have the right to do that. You know what lie we're believing there? That we get to be like God. We get to define ourselves. We get to define reality. But we can't. We don't. And you know what? As Christians, we need to... We need, to, we need to really check ourselves on this issue. I don't know if your workplace or your social groups are pressuring to you to use self-declared pronouns, 
even though they're contrary to reality. But you know what? Kids are. In kindergarten, elementary school, middle school, high school, it's all over the place. They're being pressured to affirm lies about people's gender. And let me tell you something that's a really simple thing. You don't win people to the truth by telling them lies. You don't win people to the truth by telling them lies. You don't, you don't win people to Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life by affirming deception. There's other ways around it. You could just refer to them by name. You could refer to them as they, them, or whatever. Friend, colleague. But there's so much power in lies. And you might be thinking, it's not a big deal. We'll just use the pronouns. It's not a big deal. Well, that goes back to the first lie. The temptation that sin is going to have less consequences than you might think. The hard pill to swallow there is that when you're tempted to use someone's pronouns because they tell you that that's how you have to refer to them, you think you're doing it for them, you're doing it for yourself. You're doing it to make yourself feel comfortable. You're doing it to avoid awkwardness. You're not doing it for them. You know why? When you love people, you don't lie to them. When you love people, you don't lie to them. You don't affirm their lies. And most of us know that it's a lie. Most of us know, down in the core of who we are, we know that it's a lie. But we affirm it anyways. We have to turn from that because we're reliving, we're perpetuating this cycle of what happened in the Garden of Eden. And especially as Christians, how are we going to let the world tell us how we ought to speak? Can we think about that for a second? Why are we letting the world tell us how we ought to speak? When we look at the apostles in, in, in the book of Acts, they're preaching about Jesus. They come before the governing bodies and they say, we command you not to speak in the name of Jesus. And they say, you decide for yourself if it's right for us to obey God or not. But we cannot stop. But the modern Christian in America today, we don't talk about Jesus, even though we're commanded to. And we do speak in the rules in accordance the way the world prescribes from us. There's a problem there. And maybe as adults, we don't feel that pressure as much, but the next generation is. This is like the biggest issue that students are facing in public school these days where their, their faith is being tested. Are they going to tell the truth or are they going to affirm lies? And this is the question we need to ask ourselves at all times. Are we going to obey God? Are we going to stand by his definitions of reality? Or are we going to conform to the ways of the world? What witness do we bear when we affirm the lies of the world? You don't win people to truth by telling them lies. When the woman saw in verse 6 that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Verse 6 tells us this, this decision-making process of Eve. She sees with her eyes that the tree is good for food. She's thinking with her stomach that it was a delight to the eyes. It's beautiful. And it was desired to make her wise. Those are all good things, right? Food is good. Beauty is good. And wisdom is good. All good intentions. But by this one decision, all of reality became corrupted. Sin, suffering, disease, death, strife, murder, all these things entered into reality. Let me pause here real quick and tell you temptation is not a sin. Temptation is not sin. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 4.15 that Jesus, our high priest, 
was tempted in every way as us, yet did not sin. So if temptation's a sin, then Jesus sinned, and that's absolutely false. Jesus was spotless. He was sinless. But James 1, 14 to 15, tells us the relationship between temptation and sin. It says, each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. We will all face temptation. We can't control what we're tempted to. You can't. But you have a choice. Are you going to let that temptation give birth to sin, the action, or are you going to let it stay as a temptation? Temptation is deceptive because it's always partly true. It's always a half-truth, but it's not completely truth. And remember this, half-truths are just as destructive as complete lies. But they're far more deceptive. Half-truths are just as destructive as complete lies. They're just far more deceptive. So in that sense, they're even more dangerous. You see, Eve believed that this is good for my body. This is good for my soul. This is good for my wisdom, my intellect. And then she acted on that temptation. In verse 7, it says, Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. The immediate shame, the immediate shame that follows their sin is such, such a universal experience, right? We've all felt it. When we give in to temptation and we commit that sin, immediately we're hit with shame. And you know what's destructive about sin is that that shame then draws us further and further away from God, who is the only one who is the solution to that shame. What did they do? They, they covered themselves and they hide from God. Sin always has two casualties, at least. The first is our relationship with God. And the second is our relationship with family. Satan is out to destroy our trust in God. And Satan is also out to destroy our marriages and family. Why does this matter? Because the destruction of marriage means the degradation of families and society at large because marriage is the foundation of society. I don't know if you guys have seen this kind of an old movie now, Batman Begins. But they're a scarecrow. He's trying to, you know, he's developed this serum, right, that, that creates crippling fear in everyone. But the and then, you know, Batman discovers Scarecrow's plot, or is actually Ra's al Ghul, right? But the most dangerous thing about this plot is that they're putting it into the water supply that's going to go to every person in Gotham. In the same way, when Satan destroys marriage, it destroys family. And family destroys society. It's a trickle-down effect. So many of our society's problems are rooted in the destruction of marriage and the family. Well, let me share with you guys some statistics from the foster care system. You know, and keep in mind, foster youth are children that are taken from their families by the state because it's more dangerous for them to be in that household than be in a stranger's house. Think about that. That's how bad the situation needs to be. Only 3% of foster youth will earn a college degree. 71% of girls who age out of the foster care system, that means they're not adopted by their 18th year, 71% of the girls who age out of foster care system will be pregnant by 21. 50% of children who age out will develop a substance dependence. 50% of foster youth who age out of the system will be unemployed by the age 24. 60% of child sex trafficking victims recovered in national FBI raids were children from foster care. 33% of youth become homeless after aging out of the foster care system. 
Those are some of the biggest problems our society is facing, right? Homelessness, unemployment, sex trafficking, substance abuse, underage pregnancy, lack of education. All of these are rooted in the destruction of the family, which is built on marriage. You know, what's funny is uh, a lot of people name their kids Adam, right? But how many Eves have you met? Do you guys have any friends named Eve? I, know, I don't know anybody personally named Eve, but I know like 50 Adams. Why is that? It's because we kind of blame Eve for all of this, right? Let's be honest. And you know what? The Bible recognizes that it was woman that made the mistake here. In, in, in 1 Timothy 2, verse 12 to 14, when Paul's talking about order in the church, he says, I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. It's like, whoa, Paul, like, pump the brakes, right? But clearly, I'm, the reason I'm pointing this out isn't to talk about local church order right now, but to point out that the Bible recognizes clearly that it was Eve who was deceived and became a transgressor. And I think we all realize that too, because when we're thinking about what to name our daughters, Eve is not even on the list. We're not considering naming our daughters after the woman who was responsible for the plummeting of society, right? We don't, we don't want to do that. But let me tell you this, Eve's failure was really Adam's failure. Eve's failure was really Adam's failure. And 1 Corinthians 11.3 tells us why that is the case. 1 Corinthians 11.3 says, I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. There's a biblical concept called headship that's being illustrated here in 1 Corinthians 11 and in Genesis 2 and 3. Headship is about the responsibility a husband has over his wife and his family. This view is commonly known as complementarianism. I can't teach the whole sermon on this, but basically the view of complementarianism is that men and women are created equal in the image of God, but they have different roles. They have different gender roles assigned to them, especially in marriage. And sometimes we hate this, and you might hate me. But I shared this example last week at my church. I don't know why I have a Batman illustrations today. But I didn't plan it, but this one's connected to Batman, too. So when the third Batman movie came out, The Dark Knight Rises, there was a midnight showing in Aurora, Colorado. Many of you guys know this story. And a man who was out of his mind came into a theater, had a rifle, and just started opening fire on people. When this happened, there were three young men there who were all under the age of 30. They were there on dates with their girlfriends. And when the shooting happened, all three of them threw their girlfriends to the ground, laid on top of them and covered them. All six of them were shot multiple times. All three young men died and all three girlfriends survived. This is male headship. We all know that that was the right thing to do. We're not sitting here th saying, what about equality? Why didn't the girlfriends try to flip the boyfriends and then cover them on top? No. You know why? Because we know that that, as men, that was the right thing to do. And those, those young men are celebrated as heroes, and they are. But this same kind of protection over it wasn't their wives, it was their girlfriends, maybe future wives. Is male headship demonstrated and applies in the physical as well as the spiritual? And you see God affirms this. When God shows up in the garden, who does he call to? He's not like, Eve, where are you? He calls for the man. Why? Because we read in verse 6, her husband was with her the whole time. While Eve was getting tempted by the serpent, 
Adam's standing there passively, just watching this happen, watching his wife be deceived, and then ultimately following in the same deception and action of sin. I wish I could talk more about this, but we have to move on. In verse 17, we also see that Adam, when he's criticized, when he's receiving his judgment for his failures from God, what is the judgment? Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Adam's great sin was that he listened to his wife over God. As a man, as a husband, we need to listen to the voice of God over every other voice, not just our wives. That was the failure of his male headship that allowed this to happen. That's why Eve isn't really blamed. Even in Romans, when we talk about the redemption in Christ, it's talked about as the sin and the curse of Adam. In verse 20 to 21 is where we see the good news. The Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skin and clothed them. This is a foreshadowing to the gospel. This is the first death that we see in the Bible. See, Adam and Eve tried to put together leaves and, and cover their shame, but hey, they couldn't. They deserved death. But instead of killing them in that moment, God sacrificed animals and covered their shame. We have become slaves to sin because of the fall in the Garden of Eden. But the clothing of the animal skins depicts the future redemption through the sacrifice of Jesus. In Romans 6, verse 20 to 23, it says, For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regards to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at the time of the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Only through the blood of Christ can we be restored back to the paradise that was once lost. Only through the blood of Jesus Christ can our shame be covered. Only through the blood of Jesus Christ can our relationship with God and a relationship in family be restored. Sin is far more deceptive and destructive and debilitating than we tend to think it is. And maybe you're here today thinking, yeah, I'm deceived. Yeah, I'm living a destructive life. I'm throwing away my potential. I'm, I'm hurting others. I'm debilitated because I can't even step out and live the life that I want to live because of the shame and the guilt that I carry because of my sin. All those things are true, and you're still probably underestimating how serious your sin is. But the good news is this, is that God's power and grace are infinitely greater. Because, you know, sin in the garden changed everything. The one thing it didn't change is it did not change who God is. It did not change who God is. And God was still good and merciful and gracious to Adam and Eve, and he's still good, gracious, and merciful to us today as to take on the flesh of man and to die and redeem us on the cross. His power and grace are infinitely greater. You cannot solve your sin problem. No matter how hard you try, no matter how many leaves you get, you cannot cover your shame. There's only one thing that can cover your shame. That's the blood of Jesus. So trust in him. He's the only solution to our sin. And trusting in him means trusting in the word. It means giving up your deceptive, destructive, and debilitating ways and saying, Jesus, you are Lord. You define me. You tell me how to live my life and I will follow. I will not trust in myself or anyone else anymore. I pray that this is the confession of your heart today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, that in the midst of so much darkness, in the midst of this world that is 
just collapsing around us in the midst of our, our hearts that are just debilitated by sin. We can't even trust the deception of our own minds and our hearts, Lord. In the midst of that, you shine your light. You shine the truth of Jesus. You give us your word. And he is the only solution to our sin. And we thank you that he is the free gift that we have because you have paid the price. Same way you covered Adam and Eve in their shame, Lord. You covered all of our sins and you took them away in the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus. Lord, you show us on the cross how serious our sin is that God himself needed to die in order for us to be saved. So, Lord, we come before you today and we repent. Lord, we thank you that your Holy Spirit convicts us through the truth of your word and that your kindness leads us to repentance. For, God, you are merciful and gracious to redeem sinners. You are faithful and just to forgive us as we confess our sins before you. So, Lord, would you forgive us today for how we've handled your word? Would you forgive us today to the lies that we've affirmed, the lies that we've believed? And would you cleanse us from all unrighteousness and shame by helping us put our trust fully in Jesus? Thank you so much that your grace is unending. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.